Hi friends, uh, good evening, um, good morning, wherever you are um, across the globe. Uh, today is special for us. Um, and before we really get into um, ex talking to the speaker, I would like to take some time explaining you why it is um, special to us. It was almost um, 100 days back, almost 90 to 100 days back, uh, to precise and, and when we decided to start with extra byte series, which is basically uh, getting and taking a peek into the lives of wonderful photographers from across the world, representing different genres. And um, we are airing 50th episode today. And when we started, we were skeptical. We were not certain how far we'll be able to go. And, uh, but by the, by the help of all these wonderful uh, people who are sitting as panel today um, and by the wish, good wishes of all of you out there on YouTube, um, thronging every session and making it successful, um, kind of uh, motivating us. So we are here sitting and airing our 50th episode. And today's 50th episode, we have one wonderful photographer um, from US, and uh, he's Matt Payne. Matt, uh, welcome to this um, this session of Extra Bytes, this 50th episode of Extra Bytes. And uh, um, thanks for accepting the invite to be here. And um, I hope we will have a blast today and we are really going to celebrate as, as the uh, 50th episode in, in whatever we talk about, uh, landscape photography. So welcome. Um, and thanks for accepting the invite. Um, so before again, I go into giving brief introduction about Matt, um, let me introduce you to the panelists, though you are familiar with them, for anybody who is joining in for the first time, uh, we have uh, Prakash Kumar Singh joining from Dubai. Um, we have Atanu joining from US again, and we have Sandeep Mathur uh, from Delhi, very near to where I live. Uh, very far uh, because of COVID. <laughs> we have Himadri uh, from Northeast and we have Som Roy uh, from Bangalore. All right, so uh, I was trying to figure out what will be the best introduction about Matt. Um, and it's not been easy because of certain factors that we will talk about today uh, for me to decide. So I've, I've tried and, and uh, kind of jotted down a very small paragraph let me assure you that does not do justice to what it does. Um, and I don't want to really um, make you anxious uh, by reading for five minutes on, on him. And I think it will be better that I give a brief introduction and then let him talk about, let him share his own story in his own words. So uh, Matt is a mountaineer and a fine art nature and landscape photographer living in Durango, Colorado. Uh, he loves the craft of landscape photography and has produced a podcast dedicated to that love affair since April 2017 called F-Stop, Collaborate and Listen. By the way, I got to know about it very recently, so I've joined that as well. Uh, where uh, he has some meaningful conversations with other landscape photographers all over the world. He also follows a very strict code of ethics. Now, this is very, very interesting and, and important as well. So he follows a very strict code of ethics as a nature photographer. Um, so I can go on and on. He has won so many awards. He's been exhibited um, all across and, and uh, he's done some phenomenal work as, as a landscape photographer. So Matt, um, I would really like to know uh, what I could not figure out was... Uh, how did you get into photography? 
was it because of your love for mountaineering hiking or you got into mountaineering or hiking because of your love for photography so uh, what happened first and and how did it happen and what were you doing before that well first thank you for inviting me to to join you guys for this conversation i think this is a really cool format you guys have going here and it's amazing to have this technology to be able to all talk to each other at the same time from all over the world so that's really cool um and also hopefully this isn't your last episode you know you scraped the bottom of the barrel to to get me to come on so i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah thanks for that introduction and um to answer your question you know i um not to you know spend hours and hours and hours talking telling a story but you know back in 2007 i was heavily addicted to a, a video game called world of warcraft which i'm sure some people are familiar with and i was gaining tons of weight and uh drinking like six pepsis a night and staying up to like three in the morning uh raiding with friends across the world and my wife was like you need to find something better to do with your time. <laughs> and so um, growing up, uh, my dad and mom uh, used to take me on all these mountain climbing trips pretty much every weekend in the summers here in Colorado, where we'd go car camping and then we'd climb some easier mountains. And, and you know, growing up, I kind of just idolized my dad. He would climb all of these mountains in Colorado and tell me stories about them and and, you know, just kind of just became a part of my life for, a, for many years growing up. And then it kind of just fell away as, as I got older. And I just kind of out of nowhere decided, I know what I can do to lose weight and find something more fun to do. I'm going to go climb mountains again. So uh, back in 2008, I set a goal for myself to climb the highest 100 mountains in Colorado. Uh, they're, they're kind of they're known as the Centennials here in Colorado. And 53 of those are above 14,000 feet. Um, I don't know what that translates to meters, about 4,000 meters, somewhere in that range. Um, so, you know, nothing compared to what you guys have there um, in Asia, but uh, still pretty awesome mountains. And, uh, and so I just started, uh, you know, I had a big old gut and I was fat. So I decided to um, get into shape. So. I would literally every night for probably three months straight, I would just walk up and down my stairs in my house uh, for like 50 times a day. <laughs> oh. um, and that's how I got back into shape. And then I would, and then I would start climbing. So I did crazy research on the mountains and routes and, you know, how to, how to do different approaches. And then I eventually I knew there's, there's a small handful of the mountains that are in that highest hundred that require you to have some technical skills, some some rappelling and some some traditional climbing methods and, you know, placing of protection and using ropes and whatnot. So I enlisted some friends and they taught me how to do that stuff. And as I was going through the journey early on back in 2008, I really wanted to just take pictures of my trips uh, so that I could share them with my friends and family because that was one of the things I kind of regretted about my dad, uh, his journey is that he didn't have a ton of photos from his trips. Like I'd ask him like, what was it like to climb this mountain or that mountain? He'd be like, he could only describe it, which was still fun, but he couldn't really show me pictures, right? So, so I wanted a way to document my trips so that not only I could look back and remember them, but also maybe my son or other friends might be interested. So I created this little blog. I think back then it was like um, one of those free blogging sites, like, I don't know, you know, like not GeoCities, but, you know, the successor to that. And um, then I was like, man, I want to teach myself how to build a website so that I can post all these pictures and trips. So I taught myself uh, Joomla, which is a CMS, and I built my first website called 100summits.com. And I started just doing these really long trip reports with all of my photographs uh, from all of my mountain trips. And as that evolved, probably really quickly uh, into 2010, I was getting more and more into the photography side of, of these trips. And um, mostly it was around frustration around not being able to capture the things I was seeing ad accurately or adequately uh, with the camera that I had at the time, which was a, uh, 
more or less a glorified point and shoot, although it was a little bit nicer. It was a Sony DSC 828. It was eight megapixels mm -hmm. uh, back in, I think they made that camera back in like 2002 or three or something like that. It was a good little camera, but uh, so then I, uh, I went to the library and I checked out every book at the library on photography that I could find. And I just started experimenting. I bought a uh, Nikon D7000 and a kit lens, the 18 to 105 kit lens. And I just started experimenting with portraits and editing and lighting and flash. And, you know, I made millions of horrible, horrible photographs as you all, as we all do, as we're learning photography. And um, eventually the photography side of that equation started to kind of take over the mountain climbing side of it. So um, I would plan these ridiculous trips where, you know, it wasn't good enough to just climb the mountain and get pictures from the top. I wanted to climb the mountain at 3 a.m. and get a picture from the top at sunrise. Uh, so I would start doing just crazy trips where I would backpack in, you know, 20 miles and get up at 3 a.m., hike another 2,000 feet in the dark with a GPS and trying to figure out the way up in the dark, uh, which I don't recommend if you're new to mountain climbing. But <laughs> um, And the results, you know, sometimes you'd get really amazing photographs and sometimes you wouldn't. But it was, a, I don't know, it was kind of a rush. Like maybe 10% of the time you'd be, you'd be uh, rewarded with just the most ridiculous sunrise you'd ever seen in your life. And that's incredibly addicting. So uh, that's, that's kind of my photography story. And then, you know, from there, I started branching out further and shooting the desert Southwest and, you know, shooting, you know, I've, I've been to Iceland and uh, Yosemite and other places and just, you know, anywhere I can take a camera and take pictures. Um, and then of course that's evolved quite a bit too, because I'm getting more and more into the smaller scenes and abstract photographs and more kind of just interesting, you know, rocks or plants or flowers or things that I find or patterns. So it's been, it's been a fun journey. So I've been doing it for about a decade, I guess. So, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully I wasn't too long winded. <laughs> no, no, no that, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, but uh, that brings to um, me to another question is that you started photography, um, because you wanted to document or, or what you were hiking, so you wanted to capture images of your hikes and mountaineering that you were doing. When was that moment when you decided, when a thought came to your mind that, okay, now I need to go to that hike because I do want to do photography there? You know, it's interesting because uh, for the most part, it, it didn't really work out that way for me. Um, because I had this huge list of mountains that I wanted to climb, uh, which for a lot of those, it involves driving to these remote areas, you know, finding a campsite, backpacking in. Um, so, so for me, the destinations that I had already chosen had kind of already predetermined what photographs I would take. Uh, and then as I was doing that, I, you know, during those hikes and those climbs, I would find interesting vantage points or scenes that I thought were beautiful and interesting to photograph. So, and then, and then from there, uh, after, you know, doing that for a couple of years, then I started to really want to branch out and, and do more than just documenting my mountain climbs. So um, I wouldn't necessarily say that it kind of diverted me off of into a different path necessarily, but it definitely forced me to think about my trips as more than just a mountain climb. It was also like, okay, I'm climbing this mountain and what are some interesting photographs I can make while I do it? So that um, became like this, uh, I don't know, these two talking heads in my brain at the same time, like, okay, you got to get to the top safely and you got to watch out for weather, but you also need to take some really interesting photographs too that aren't just documenting your trip. They're more than that, right? It's, I think at some point as photographers, we realize that there's more to landscape photography than just taking pretty pictures of things we think are pretty. Uh, 
So I think one of the first moments where I experienced that was uh, I was on a backpacking trip in 2009, 2000, 2009, 2010. I can't, I think it was 2010. And um, it was, it was pre- to a pretty remote location with uh, two relatively difficult mountains and one of them required rope. And I got this idea with my buddy to climb to the top of one of them um, before sunset and photograph sunset from the summit and then come down in the dark. And I don't think I would have ever done that before if I didn't have a camera with me. Um, so it, it forced me to start doing some really just kind of crazy things that, and I still do it like two weeks, two weekends ago. I think it's one of the pictures I chose for what you'd asked me to pick out, but I did kind of the same thing. It was like sunset and I was like, oh, this feels really stupid, but I'm going to climb halfway up that mountain and get a photograph, <laughs> um, which, you know, especially when you're by yourself, it doesn't always feel very safe or I guess, I don't know, is smart's the right word, but I always, the whole time I was like, this is maybe not a good idea. This is maybe not a good idea. Um, but so it's always in the back of my mind, like, just, you know, don't get hurt. <laughs> so, Yeah. Okay, it's very interesting. But uh, let's say you started with um, shooting mountains because of because you were mountaineering already. But uh, you still you 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 still shoot that shoot them. But you have also ventured into shooting some other stuff as well in terms of landscape. And uh, but does do you find um, anything other than mountains to be really interesting as your subject, landscape subject? Um, or you still find um, uh, mountains as as the main subject, with, which kind of challenge you as well in in terms of the effort that it requires to climb up and reach those uh, spots um, where from where you can actually uh, vantage points from where you can actually create those stunning images. Yeah, it's funny because I think. Um embedded in that question is kind of a question of, of motivation and also reward, right? For me as the photographer, yeah. because I, I personally still find a lot of joy in shooting simpler scenes that I could drive to and get out of the car and walk five minutes and find a really interesting photograph. I find joy in that, absolutely. Um, however, there's, I think, Part of the whole mountain thing for me here in Colorado is that it's, I grew up hiking and climbing and and it's, there's some nostalgia involved in that, but it's also, there's a, uh, it's almost like gambling. There's like a a tremendous amount of risk and a tremendous amount of reward um, to dedicate that amount of effort and time to a location. And you may not come away with a photograph that's very good, but when you do get conditions that are great, you're going to get a photograph that probably nobody else in the world has. So it's, so it, for me, it's, there's that kind of um, that r- high risk, high reward element to it that I kind of enjoy uh, because there's, there's this whole, uh, I don't know, there's this whole mindset that's wrapped up into that and in anticipation of like as you're hiking and and watching the weather develop and and looking at the scene you know um you get emotionally wrapped up into visualizing what could happen yeah. um but i think there's a lot there's also a, a high risk of that causing you to have some this a lot of disappointment um because let's any of any of us who do any landscape you know we've definitely had that experience where you go out into the field expecting great conditions and then you come back and it's, or you get there and it's just not what you visualized at all, or there's no clouds or, the, or you're trying to do night photography and it's nothing but clouds, you know? So um, what I've learned uh, to kind of counteract that is, um, and it, it came, it actually has come very naturally to me. I just never thought about it from a photography perspective is that I find lots of other things interesting on the way as well. And I don't necessarily need to depend on uh, good conditions to make interesting photographs or to take photographs of things that I find interesting. So like an example of that, it was just two weeks ago. I, like I was telling you, I did this crazy mountain climb and, and um, halfway up, I noticed the clouds weren't doing what they were supposed to, what I thought they were going to do, right? My expectation. And I actually, and you know, this 
bright sun was hitting and I actually find this found this really awesome uh, arrangement of uh, this plant called a corn lily. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people in the, they call it skunk plant or I don't know, it has lots of different weird names. Uh, but it has all these really interesting patterns and you can get some really cool photographs of it. And of course the sun was shining super bright. So the light was super harsh. Um, but I decided I, I wanted to try to get a really good photograph of it. And I figured out how to do it. So I got my coat and I created like a, a light shield, you know, to, to diffuse the light from hitting the plants. And I did that with my tripod and my camera and made some really fun photographs. So for me, it's, um, I think having a natural curiosity of the natural world and being interested in what you see and find is a healthy way to kind of balance out that high risk, high reward thing, because I had all these aspirations of getting all these crazy photographs that trip and it didn't necessarily pan out the way I expected, but still had a great experience. So that was a really long winded answer. To no, 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 no. <laughs> I think that's important. But, but um, um, just awesome. uh, on the lighter note, I would also like to add that so when you get rewarded, so you get an image, you come back with an image that becomes the background of your Zoom session and extra bites as well. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Okay, so um, we have a lot of questions, but I think we would like to first get into um, seeking inspiration of through your images that you have you have created so far, and maybe listen to those interesting stories behind them. So okay, sure. Yeah, take us through that. All right, let me uh, let me oh, pull yes. pull this up. Yeah. Okay. Are you able to to see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. So this was probably one of my first um, photographic experiences where I felt more like a photographer than a mountaineer. This was taken back in 2011 with a, a Nikon D7000 and a kit lens. So you can make good photos of the kit lens. Uh, and this is actually from the summit of a mountain called Wetterhorn and it's a it's not a terribly technically challenging mountain to climb, but it does require a little hand over hand class three climbing. And uh, I'll never forget this day though, because uh, I remember we started out really early in the morning before sunrise in the dark. And, you know, I don't know if you spend any time hiking in the dark before sunrise, but what I like about it is that you, the light slowly changes from you know nautical twilight into blue hour, uh, and then into kind of golden hour, and it's it's a very quick transition once the sun starts cresting the horizon. And I remember never forget this because I wasn't carrying a tripod, <laughs> had a kit lens, not a great camera, uh, so I I remember cresting the summit of the mountain and right as the sun was. Uh, cresting the horizon and it was just like the perfect timing. I scrambled to throw a bunch of rocks together in a pile so that I could make my own little tripod and I did like a little just a little panorama of the scene and and it's just one of those moments uh, that kind of encapsulates why I do what I do. You get to the top of a mountain and you can be rewarded with some pretty amazing light so uh, that that's just one of my favorite kind of early moments as a photographer slash mountaineer so that's there you go uh, and and with that image you'll give a run uh, uh, like uh, all those uh, full frame cameras around for the money <laughs> yeah right i mean you don't need an expensive camera to make good photos yeah i think good photos make cameras expensive <laughs> as long as you're right. like feet, you know, starting in the morning, you don't need you know you don't need any expensive gear. You can even take take a, just a, you know APS-C camera, and that will kind of beat any full frame camera, any light, right? That's I think what matters most. The like effort. That's I think. Yeah, uh, that's I think, I think, I think it's yeah, yeah. I think it's more important to put yourself into situations that uh, reward you with with. Uh, good experiences that can potentially yield great photographs. I don't think the equipment is secondary to me. Um, although don't get me wrong, I love cameras and lenses and I could talk for hours about that too, but it's just not, for me, it's not really what makes good photography. Yeah. Quick one. So when you started photography, uh, 
and obviously you were already a mountaineer right so how did you balance your backpack when it all started yeah it's well it's funny because when i first started uh doing this um i was just carrying one camera one lens that was on the on the camera so it wasn't that bad i have a uh it's called a low pro top loader it's a shoulder harness bag yeah. and um it fits perfectly right on your chest gives you quick access to your camera so i've been using that ever since uh, 2011 and i still use it today um, I think as the years go on, and we'll talk a little bit about that, the gear got more and more uh, heavy. And I've made some conscious decisions about, you know, how to do that a little bit more intelligently. But I would say when I first started, the weight wasn't really that big of a problem. Uh, it became more of a problem as I had more and more lenses and had more and more crazy ideas of the things I wanted to make from the tops of mountains, you know, carrying a telephoto lens, for example. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure. When you when you carry like chest mounted uh, bag, you know, chest mounted um, camera camera pouch, you know, I have tried that. But I feel that you know you always kind of tend to trip off, you know, not trip off, but essentially you can't see your feet, and that challenges uh, that poses some problem. Do you face that, or do you kind of, you know, you might not even face that because you are already kind of experienced, you know, why your feet is already going through. But what do you like? How do you overcome any kind of, you know? those kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I have, I actually haven't really had that problem with the top loader. Although I will say um, when I'm um, usually when I'm coming down and, yeah, yeah. Like that, and yeah. I'm a little bit more worried about the shifting of my weights, I'll usually take it off um, and put it in my backpack uh, just mm -hmm. to keep the, the, the weight from kind of shifting me forward too much. Uh, but when I'm going up, it's not a problem at all. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. And um, can you like share us a little bit of story about this uh, this peak? Like, you know, did you start like really early morning? Did you camp here, or did you just you know drive from your home and then just directly climb at the we are of night? Yeah. So, so in order to get to this location, you. You basically have to drive um, a couple of hours from the highway on a pretty rough road. And then usually mo what most people do is they'll set up like a little, you know, a tent. There's a, lots of little camp areas. Um, it's not like a campground or anything, but there's lots of open camping. And then, yeah, I just got up at, I want to say that day we got up at 3 a.m., I'm pretty sure. Um, and then from our uh, campsite, which was at about 11,000 feet, then we hiked up um, to the top of the mountain right before sunrise, which I think was like 5.30 a.m. So we were also moving pretty fast to get there in time for sunrise. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, ready to move on to another photo or do you have more questions? Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, please. All right, cool. So this is probably my favorite photograph ever taken. Um, it, there's a lot of reasons for that. Obviously, the moment, <clears throat> this moment in time, I don't think I'll ever be able to um, beat it, <laughs> photographically speaking. Uh, but in order to get to this particular location, um, my climbing partner and I, who is my best friend, uh, we back, it was about a 40 mile backpack and round trip. Uh, there's easier ways to get here that take less time, but we took the long way because we're stupid. But <laughs> um, but uh, basically, in order to get to this location, uh, you have to backpack in pretty far and then get up at around two or three in the morning again, climb to the top, and then get lucky enough to have light like this. So this was, again, back in 2011 with a Nikon D7000 and a Tokina 11 to 16, uh, which is a great lens for its time. And it, I think you can buy one now for like $300. Um, but uh, this, I didn't even really, photo, photographically speaking, I, I did not really know what I was doing as much either. So I shot this panorama at F4. I think I was, if I were to go back and do it, I'd probably shoot it at like F8 or F11. Um, but it still worked out. <laughs> um, but what's cool about this particular scene is that it, it represents 
uh, my favorite part of Colorado, um, and this is called the Needle Mountains in the San Juan Mountains. And it's about 30 miles north of where I live. So, and that's the main reason why I moved here was to be closer to these mountains. Um, and what's cool about them for me is they're not easily accessible. So if you want to be in these places and take photographs of them, you do need to put some effort into it. Um, obviously, physical effort doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make better photographs. But for me, it's how I make better photographs that I find interesting for myself and personally meaning, personally meaningful. Um, so pretty much all of these high points, I've climbed all of them. Um, and that's one of the re other reasons why I like this photograph is that I can just walk through left to right and name all of these photos. And it reminds me of a memory of a trip that I've done. Um, and it was some, some of the most incredible light. You might not be able to see it either, but um, what was really special about this morning is that as we were climbing up, there was a, I think it's called a, a family, but there was a family of mountain goats, um, mm. like, like a couple older ones and then a bunch of baby goats. And they're making all this, these crazy cute sounds <laughs> in the dark. Just, I don't even, I can, I'm not even gonna try to copy it, but you can, <laughs> might be able to see it. There's actually a goat right there um, in the shot, oh, yeah, which yeah. was, which was pretty cool. Uh, so, so yeah, it was just a really special moment. Um, and I think the other reason why I like photographs like this is that it reminds me of a very special memory uh, with a very special person that's close to me. Uh, his name is Silas. So uh, that, that's another reason why this photograph is just powerful for me personally. And um, uh, Matt, some, some, uh, some uh, go on, yes, go on. So I just wanted to uh, ask this is obviously a panel, uh, multiple shots. So, yeah, this was, um, I wanted, shots? yeah, so again, like I said, I didn't really know what I was doing back then. Um, nowadays, I would probably shoot this panorama with my camera in portrait orientation and do, um, do you know, do like eight or nine photos stitched. This is almost 360 degrees. Actually, I think it is 360 degrees, uh, which is also kind of what makes it kind of neat. But it's, I want to say it was seven photos in landscape orientation. Um, and it oh. is actually, uh, you know, I was shooting that D7000. So there was, I want to say I used two exposures per image. So I did I was actually bracketing back then. I don't do a lot of bracketing anymore, but I think I took a, an exposure for the sky and exposure for the foreground and I blended them together in the panorama, which is not easy. <laughs> well, at least it isn't for me. Maybe you guys got a better way to do that. But Lightroom has made it easier now. But in it those has. days, in the D7000 days, Lightroom did not have... Uh, HDR panorama, so that was a little bit more complicated. Yeah, and actually, I think um, I've re-edited this photo probably six times over the years, <laughs> and this is my most my most recent edit. Um, it's a little bit cleaner, um, but yeah, I I um, I think I actually hand blended the whole thing. I didn't want to use software to do it, so yeah, fun. Very interesting. Um, how much how much height this would be like um, just for our understanding that you hike a lot so um, this particular scene um, what kind of height did you gain and how much time did it take you to really uh, reach this spot and click this image and maybe um, even another input is that all these places have the hiking trails uh, or you have to create your own trail somehow and then be there. Yeah, good questions. So this particular image was taken at about 14,000 feet, a little bit higher than that, like 14,037 or something like that. I can't remember the exact elevation of this mountain. Um, where you, there's lots of ways to approach this area. Uh, the most traditional approach is actually to take a train uh, from Durango and then get off halfway in between Durango and Silverton. And then you hike up a, a trail into an area called Chicago Basin. Um, the train drops you off at about 
8,500 feet, and then you back back up into an area that's at about 10,000 feet. So then you have to gain about 4,000, 4,000, 3,500 feet to get to here. Um, the way that I approached it was from a completely different trailhead, um, a long ways away, but it's, but that trailhead starts you at 11,000 feet. And then it, it, it's a very flat hike across this really long, uh, mesa. And, and then you drop down several up and down several mountain passes to get here. Um, I just wanted to do the long way and I didn't want to depend on the train for this particular trip, but yeah, it's, I think the shortest route to get here is by taking train and you're still going to spend, it's about, oh, I think 10 to 15 miles round trip, depending on your extracurricular activities in the basin. That's, <laughs> that is long actually. I think uh, this, yeah. makes this, uh, this makes all of your photographs really unique. Like, you know, even if someone tries, they have to be like really kind of best of their safe or, you know, they have to like really know their stuff, what they're doing in mountains to get or even even if they want to kind of recreate similar frame of you so you know your frames will be like really unique and they can't copy they're by default by the nature of your how you take it they're copy protected like you don't even have to tell that you know this is my photo and don't even come stomp my pictures you know it's naturally naturally protected from any other kind of you know anybody who tries to steal your frame or something like that or trying to recreate right that's i think something great about your pictures well thank you yeah i mean there's a there's a small handful of us here in colorado that do are crazy enough to do this kind of stuff um jack brower is probably the most well-known mountain photographer here in colorado um my buddy kane engelbert uh, back in when he was in his 30s and 40s he used to do a lot of this kind of stuff um and there, so there there are people that do it but yeah it's um it definitely by nature of just you know the time commitment and the elements of you know getting to these places and the how long it takes i think it does kind of weed out the uh potential for people copying it <laughs> yeah yeah, Matt, yeah thank uh, you but i had a question like uh, these 10 15 miles that you spoke about uh, you did it on a single day itself or you uh, like camped there for a couple of days yeah so <laughs> For this, the, the, that's that's another reason why I love this photograph because it represents an absolutely mind-boggling adventure um, that was kind of just a, it was a physical feat uh, to accomplish this particular trip just because of this, the way that we did it. Um, so this particular trip we did over the course of four days and we covered about 50 miles in total. Um, the very last day that we did this trip, uh, my friend Silas and I got up at about 4 a.m. and we climbed, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but we climbed this mountain, which is called Wyndham Peak. Um, we did that at, um, you know, right before sunrise. And then we climbed all the way back to our tent, which you can't see where we were camped. We were camped down in this basin somewhere. Um, probably, we were actually probably camped over in here somewhere. Um, we went back to our campsite, packed up, and we hiked all the way back to our car, which was about 20 miles away. Oh. So in that one day, we climbed the mountain and backpacked all the way back out. So it was a, we started at 4 a.m. and got back to the truck at 11 p.m. Wow. Um, and, and we didn't stop to do much other than snack and eat a little food and drink some water. So. And our packs back then were heavier too. You know, we were carrying about 50 pounds. So yeah, it was, it was kind of stupid. <laughs> <laughs> that is hard. That is hard. That is hard. That is hard. Anything, that is a, anything more that than is an incredible mile of 15 miles is like really difficult. You know, 10 miles is still kind of okay in a day or 15 miles is still okay. In, in a mountain road like, you know, Colorado, uh, mountain trail, but 20 miles is like crazy. Like that's crazy. Yeah, and to answer one of your other questions, uh, Jassy, uh, there, there is a trail um, that comes up into this basin right here. This is called Chicago Basin. There is a nice trail that gets you up there. And there's actually a pretty good trail that gets you up into this area as well. Um, it's once you start ascending onto these ridges where you kind of leave trail and you have to kind of pick your route. Um, although, uh, sorry, this mountain over here, Aeolus, 
it doesn't look like it but there is a trail like this little thing right here is called the catwalk so it's got about a 500 foot drop on either side but it, i don't know it's probably about the size of like half of a sidewalk um to cross that little notch there and then you kind of just weave your way up through these rocks to the top so it's not I mean, it's not like crazy technical climbing, although you just need to be careful. I mean, you can die for sure, but it's not, it's not like climbing Everest or anything like that. <laughs> you can die for sure, but, but it's okay. <laughs> If you're not careful, yeah, for sure. There is risk involved. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah. Uh, any other questions about that I one? I think we can move ahead, yeah. All right, cool. So you're going to see a theme here of... Um, my love for panoramas at sunrise or sunset. So this particular photograph, um, I'm just gonna go back one, two photos just to show you real quick. Uh, remember this photo I took from Wetterhorn. Yeah. This particular mountain here is called Uncompagre over here, uh, right there. Okay. This photograph is from the top of Uncompagre and this mountain over here is Wetterhorn. So it gives you an idea of the relationship between those two mountains. So uh, when I photographed this uh, image, I was actually living in Oregon at the time and I was a little bit less in shape because I was living at sea level, but I was coming back every summer to climb mountains. And um, I really pushed my body hard to get to this spot before sunrise. Like I was, I was gassed, you know, I was, I had spent all my energy to get here, but um, there was a lot of wildfires that summer. So that's why you see it's kind of hazy. Mm -hmm. um, but it created some really interesting light in the clouds um, with the kind of the orangish, per I mean, I know some people don't like magenta and all that, but like that's really how it looked just because of the way the, the, um, the smoke was diffusing the light and adding all that cyan in there. So if you either hate cyan and magenta or you like it. So, um, but yeah, this is a really great spots and um what i love about this particular image is that uh, um and i'll show you later another photograph of this area over here but this is another one of my favorite areas in colorado to go in autumn uh, because these these valleys fill up with just amazing color um, from aspen trees uh, but this is an awesome part of colorado so it's like wetterhorn and there's a mountain called coxcomb and um so yeah it's just beautiful place and this this mountain this is actually the fifth highest <clears throat> mountain in colorado i shot this from on compagre peak so it's mm -hmm. like 14,400 feet something like that okay okay yep so now i have a question here that um um in terms of photography um you usually hike to these places all alone or with one person, one friend, or you are always in a group of three to four? Yeah, so for photos like this, I'm usually either by myself or I'm with one other person. So for the for these, actually, this photograph, I was with the exact same person I was with with the previous photograph, um, my best friend Silas. Um, he does not take photographs, so we have lots of jokes about how I make him climb to the tops of mountains in the dark to get sunrise photos. Um, but he's a trooper and does it with me and we have amazing experiences because of it. Um, and then the first photograph I showed you, I photographed with my friend Regina, who also I've climbed a few mountains with as well. So I would say it's a mixture. And as we go through um, some of these, I can tell you if I was by myself or not, if that helps. But this one, I was with one other person. Okay, now next thing is that uh, do these places also are crowded? Are, are these places also crowded as other um, places in US or stunning landscape places? Um, they are crowded with photographers and people who are conducting photography tours and workshops. <laughs> no, I mean, th so there is, a, there, there is a growing popularity of people climbing these mountains. They're called the 14ers. Um, and I, there's data that shows like over the last 10 years, that's, there's been a lot more people climbing those mountains, but in terms of coupling it with photography, it's pretty unusual. And in terms of, yeah, like up here at sunrise, I was the only person up there. I was the only person up there and I was definitely the only person up there with a camera. 
And I was also the only person dumb enough to also carry a tripod up there. So. <laughs> Matt, uh, one quick question. Uh, you moved to Oregon. Uh, why? That's a great question. So uh, it, has nothing, it had nothing to do with photography. Uh, I, uh, was, I grew up in, Colo in Colorado Springs, which is a very uh, conservative place to live, um, politically and socially conservative. And that's, that's not how I am personally. So my wife and I wanted to live somewhere different and experience what that would be like. So we moved to Portland, Oregon, and we lived there for a couple of years, really enjoyed it. I missed the Colorado mountains and decided to move back. <laughs> In a nutshell. Yeah. I actually have a whole article on my website about why I moved and so yeah. did you, I mean, it's, it's a pretty crowded scene in Oregon, right? So did you bump into the big names from the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, I'm assuming you mean photographers? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, well, I got kind of lucky enough. I, I went to a, back then it was, the big site was 500px, right? Right. And uh, I went to a 500px meetup with the founder of 500px. Wow. Um, and he was just happening to do a meetup uh, at a bar that was like a mile from my my house my apartment and uh, I met some really great people I met Michael Bellino there um, Jeremy Cram was there um, yeah lots there was lots of really great photographers that I met there and then we started to go out and take pictures together so I kind of just got lucky uh, but yeah I ran into to a few people and made uh, became friends with them yeah yeah, my, Mike's great. I mean, Mike's great. He's got a very different eye. Yeah, I love his work a lot. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. And just one technical question about this image that's come on YouTube is that how many images were stitched for to create this? Oh, man. I'm going to say, so this time I actually used my camera the right way because this was in 2015. 15 2015 so um i want to say it was like one two three four it was like six or seven this isn't 365 degrees so yeah i want to say seven okay. um yeah great thank you cool yeah any yeah. other questions about that one i think we can move all right let's do it all right well so early on um, one of the things I got really obsessed with was night photography. Um, I don't do a ton of it now. I mean, I do like a, a couple a year now, but I used to do it almost exclusively. If it was not mountain climbing season, I'd go to the desert or something to do night photography. Um, and so this was uh, shortly after I moved here to Durango, I decided to go down into New Mexico. This is called the Bistai Badlands. And it's a really, really cool area in the middle of nowhere with all these weird uh, rock formations and hoodoos. And it's a, it's a great dark sky area with uh, great views of the Milky Way. Um, and so this is, a, this is actually the moon rising. Um, I want to say this is like 3 a.m. Um, and of course, the Milky Way panorama. I want to say this one was about five images stitched. Um, with a Nikon D800 and a 14 to 24. And I had actually pre-scouted this on uh, Gaia GPS during the day a couple of months prior. So I had my waypoints all set in Gaia so that I could hike around in this weird landscape in the dark because there's no trails in, in Bistai. It's all just randomly walking through the desert in all these little canyons and stuff. So I wanted to make sure I could refine it again. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I love shooting the Milky Way in the desert and try to find unique uh, photos of the Milky Way. I think it's become more and more popular as camera sensors have gotten better that people do night photography. But I've been doing Milky Way stuff since since 2011 um, and, and I really enjoy it. Great, great. Sandeep, you want to ask anything on this? No, I think I'm good. Uh, Matt, I, I is just a single a... layer. Uh, Matt, Matt, is that a single layer? Single a single layer? layer? Yes, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, uh, a single row. A single yeah, row. single single row. Yeah. So, so is it like a, is it near the place uh, like there's a place called Asislepa Wilderness or Denali so, Park? Place. 
Or... It's close-ish. Um, that's a little bit further okay. uh, east. Okay. And okay. south, okay. a little bit further south as well. Okay. But yeah, same general area in kind of north central New Mexico. Yeah. So uh, Matt, you mentioned uh, when you were describing this image, you mentioned that you sent the waypoints. Can you explain that to us? What do you mean by that? Sure. So I use an application on my phone called Gaia GPS. And what's cool about Gaia is that you can download all of the maps um, onto your phone and you can have access to them while your phone is in airplane mode. So you don't need cell service. And what I like to do on a lot of my trips is use that to pre-plan on the computer, but then also uh, you can use it to scout locations during the day so that you can return the, to them at night or in the dark. Um, and, and you can record your tracks so that you really all you need is your phone and you can kind of just follow your tracks especially if you're going to places that don't have trails. Um, it's really helpful to be able to find your way. It's also really helpful to, wait, to find your way back to the car in the dark. <laughs> um, so yeah, I use that a lot yeah, sure. in my photography. Mm -hmm. so, so what is it called? Uh, Gaia? Gaia GPS. GPS. Yeah, GPS. Yeah, there's oh. actually a, I have a, yeah. We can talk about this later, but I'm actually going to be putting a lot of work into my YouTube channel this year. And um, I just put out a video on YouTube a couple months ago on like a tutorial for photographers for Gaia GPS. Um, so yeah, I use it a okay. lot. That's great. Yeah, Gaia GPS is like a must, a must have for all the hikers, in, at least in North America. It's definitely a kind of... Uh, no, yeah, there's got, different... It's pretty good across... Gaia GPS are all trails. Both of them are really good. I mean, it's kind of like all trails. There's also Garmin. There's also, um, I think, uh, Caltopo is another Cal application. Topo, yeah, yeah. yeah Caltopo, um, I have found, found that it's very, you know, very nice to like create maps beforehand, you know, where it, where it doesn't have any, you know, exact maps and all and capture the elevation. Yeah, I, I think Gaia Pro so far, I think, has like across the world, that's one solution that has salvaged yeah, yeah. a lot of my trips. And then next is Garmin, which is on yeah. my watch. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, just quickly point out about this photo that I like about it and I, I try to strive for in my photography is I, I um, if anyone ever listens to my podcast, Atanu can probably attest to this. I'm fairly outspoken against um, creating images that aren't true to an actual experienceable thing just because I feel like as an art form, photography is, uh, has always been rooted in uh, a depiction of something that actually could or did occur. And so, and I think the general public kind of trusts photography that way, even as an art form, which I think makes it kind of unique as an art form. And so I try to, as best as I can, try to keep my photos as true to an actual experienceable place or thing. So that's why I like this one because it is a single exposure. The Milky Way was, Milky Way was really there. The light yeah. from the moon uh, that was shining actually created the foreground light. So it, they're all single exposures in this image just stitched together in a panorama, but it's a real place, the real time. Yeah. And I personally think that's important. Yep. And I agree. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is I agree. I completely agree. So, so, uh, so, so no tracker, just, just single shots. Just single shots. Yeah, I don't have a tracker, although I've used one before. I think they're pretty cool. Um, and this was uh, before people were really doing uh, stacking. So, and I still don't do any stacking, yeah. I think because I'm lazy. But yeah, I, I don't stack or track. I almost always just do either single exposures or two exposures, one for the sky, one for the foreground. But I don't. Yeah, I keep it pretty simple. And, uh, Love it. That's good. Cool. We can move on. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, one of my favorite places here in Colorado. This is about, again, about 40 miles north of me. Um, it's This area has become pretty popular because of Instagram and people posting videos and Instagram stuff from this spot. I'm not going to say what it is, but I think anyone who's ever been 
to Southwest Colorado probably knows this this spot. But uh, I love this scene just because it it does represent one of my favorite places. And I love this this flower. It's called a marsh marigold, um, and that's actually what I titled the photograph, marsh marigolds. Uh, but um, this uh, there's this mountain, this big mountain face on the upper right. It's called the U.S. Grant Peak, um, which is a really fun mountain climb. I've climbed it. Actually, climbed it the day I took this photograph. Uh, and yeah, I just just one of my favorite photos. Just just one question here that. Um... You have decided to uh, present a portrait um, orientation of this particular image. Do you have you clicked the landscape orientation also? Um, and why did you decide to um, kind of compose it this way? Um, in oh, yeah. Yeah. So, any any particular thought on that? Yeah. So the reason why I chose a, a portrait orientation for this composition, I think, is because of the way that the elements were arranged and that the way that the, the sunlight was shining at a, at a vertical angle down towards kind of the middle of frame here. Uh, so what I like about this image is that it, it has something of visual interest in the foreground and the bottom right. And then I think the flowers do a pretty good job of leading the eye up to this bright spot here. But then mm -hmm. also this line created by the sunbeam brings you back up to the to the sun so it kind of pulls your pulls your attention kind of in a i guess in an s curve type of a fashion uh compositionally i think i think i did try to do this one uh as a landscape and it, it just didn't work as well compositionally plus uh you can't necessarily tell this was a 14 millimeter photograph um it's not it's not perspective blended at all although it, it is focus stacked but it's uh, the mountain really is that close. So in order to do a photograph like this of um, to include the mountain, you would have to do like uh, basically a panorama of up and down. So, so that was also the only way I could get it in a single exposure. Wow. At 14 millimeters even. So, so Matt, again- With, with the flowers. <laughs> Yeah. Matt, again, just very quickly, uh, digressing a little bit, you mentioned about tagging locations, and obviously you did not give up the location on this shot. So it's part of your code of ethics, I assume? It right? is, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a very controversial subject, and it's even one that I struggle with uh, personally, and we can talk more about nature first if you want, but... Yeah, we will uh, but yeah, it's um, I. It, to me, it's not never share locations. I think that's too um, extreme, too extreme, too black and white. I think for me, it's um, and this is actually the language we use for the nature first principle. It's use discretion when sharing locations. So, you know, for example, if I know somebody personally and I know that they have an appreciation of a place, they understand that you shouldn't set up your tent within a hundred feet of this lake and they understand that you should bury your poop um, or burn your toilet paper or carry it out you know like they understand leave no trace um, and if they have those ethics and they share those ethics and they have that education I'm more than willing to tell people like yeah this is where I took this photograph but if it's just to the general public who may or may not be equipped with that information or knowledge and the location might not necessarily be capable of handling visitation on a large scale, then I don't share the location. Unfortunately, that particular thought process is not shared widely, and especially for this location. And actually, I don't know if you follow the Public, Han Public Lands Hates You account on Instagram, but he called out a guy who has like 1.2 million followers on Instagram for posting videos of this place and providing absolutely no context or education as to how to you know, behave yourself there. And as a consequence of that guy, I believe there are many, many, many more visitors to this particular location. It was set five, six years ago, you could go to this place on a weekend in summer and see maybe five or six people. Now you can't go to this location and it'll, it'll be on a Saturday, there'll be 20, 30, 40 people here easy. And it's not that easy to get to. So 
Um, and it's high tundra, so it can't really handle the visit. Like if people walk on these flowers, they get crushed. So, and you actually have seen that happen to these places is, um, I bet if you went back here this summer, all these flowers close to the shore are probably, they're probably not even there. If my, if I had to guess, I might go back this year to look at it, but it's just, it's not to try to prevent people from going places. It's to prevent people from going places without information that they should have before going. That was long winded. Sorry. Totally, no, totally understand your uh, uh, emotions and your feelings here. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, have similar stories, which I'll be probably sharing later on. And coming to speak of this image, like this image makes me sulk a bit because as of today, I have been sitting at probably 12,000 feet on the bank of a lake uh, somewhere in the high Himalayas in Kashmir had this COVID not happened because we had a we had a trip planned it was an eight days trek and we would have visited eight uh, or nine lakes uh, within a span of uh, eight and nine days oh so man this that is, this is exactly this is exactly the kind of image that i would have uh, been sitting or landscape that i would have been sitting in front of as of this day today it was supposed to uh, take place day before yesterday the trek well so Sorry that it reminds you of your inability no, it's, it's to travel. Totally it's totally fine. I am just sulking a bit, so I thought I. I but but at least we have something to look at now, thanks to me. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Well, I I totally appreciate that because I know a lot of people's uh, plans have kind of been ruined. Oh yeah, all of us. Yeah. Except Atanu, I think. I think Atanu has traveled a bit. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Are yeah, you guys ready? That is one of the reasons that we decided to start these. Because we wanted to visit these exotic places through Zoom now. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, and I, I mean, to, to your point, I completely understand why somebody would be excited about this location and want to share it with people and tell people about it. It's just that if you have a million followers on Instagram, you should probably think about... Yeah, what that is gonna, what that's gonna do to a place. I mean, I think, one, I think it's, yeah, you have to be responsible. I think that's where you know, the, the, with great powers comes great responsibility comes into. Yeah, yeah, know, that exactly. So I think it is important that when somebody is sharing a video, he starts with that information that, um, um, that this is how you need to behave. And uh, I don't know, um, I don't know what's wrong with. Don't, people. don't even share. Don't even share. I mean, why sharing with one point two million? Yeah, million? first of all, it don't even up. share. So, but but even when people reach there, I, I, I find it little, I find it little annoying when, when you're saying that yeah. people are trampling over these flowers. I mean that requires common sense. You don't have to be told and guided not to do this. Um, yeah, I mean you think it's common sense, and I, I'm honestly <laughs> though the the people that are going these places are not typically people that have grown up in the outdoors and spent a lot of time it's people that they saw it on instagram and they're like oh that's amazing i want to go there and you know i don't think i don't think i think most like 99 percent of the people doing those things they don't have bad intentions i think they just really don't know that it's going to have a, have an impact right. and i think yeah, the more people like, that, like of Information, lack of information, lack of education. Right. So that's, you know, that's essentially what we're trying to do with Nature First is educate people on, you know, just just be thoughtful. And I, I have to admit, too, I, as one of the founders of Nature First, I still struggle with it. I mean, I was doing a YouTube video the other day recording it, and I, I caught myself. I was like, here I am at this place. And then I was like, oh, should I... Should I be telling people about this place? And then you, and then you're conflicted with all these thoughts, like, oh, what do I? Oh, and no, I guess now, you know. So it's, it's not easy even for me. So I get it. Yeah, I understand. It's a fine balance that you have to always tread on, and uh, there's nothing all right and wrong because somebody has to take it the wrong way. He will still take it the wrong way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Should we move on? But coming back to this image, this is a fantastic image. This is fantastic. This is amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm hoping to get some more similar to this here next week. Uh, end of next week, I'm doing about. Uh, sorry, not to make you jealous, guys, but I'm gonna do like an like an eight day trip up in this these areas to do some wildflower photography. So. All right, man. We don't have. We don't have. Yourself, please. <laughs> don't don't kick me out of the Zoom chat. <laughs> All we have our backgrounds. That's it. Right. <laughs> All right, should we uh, should we move on yeah. to the next one? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. All right. So this uh, this probably represents uh, maybe the my top two top three moments of photography in my life as a mountain climber and as a photographer. Uh, there's a really I think it's a cool story anyway. There's a cool story behind this image, and um, again, just to give you a little bit of context. Wow. Of, of where this was photographed. Uh, this mountain right here, right in front of the sun is called Jagged Mountain. And um, you might recognize these two pointy guys. This is Arrow and Vestal. And um, if you remember this image, uh, this is Arrow and Vestal. And that photo that, I, that we're gonna talk about, I photographed from this mountain right here. Oh. Uh, so, uh, so that's the context, and this photo is looking east at sunrise. It was actually a, th a three a three panel stitch vertical panel stitch at like forty five millimeter, forty two millimeter. It says, huh. and um, but yeah, this uh, I, this was a harder one to get uh, of any of the photos I have because to get to this mountain, um, you do have to do a pretty intense backpack. It's not long, but it's about eight miles and it's very steep. Um, you gain about 3000 feet in four miles and it's, and it's pretty relentless and there's not a lot of trail. It's you're ducking under fallen trees and it's just, it's brutal. I mean, everyone I know that's been to this area before is like, yeah, that place is hard to get to. But I actually, uh, my goal for this trip when I took this photograph was kind of threefold. Uh, I wanted to get, uh, I wanted to climb this mountain and another mountain that's next to it called Pigeon Peak. Um, and they're in the highest hundred of Colorado. And I wanted to photograph the Perseid meteor shower. And I wanted to get a good sunrise photo, which obviously you can see was accomplished. But uh, the day that I backpacked up into this basin, I got up there about 5 p.m made dinner um, and set up my campsite and tried to sleep, but I couldn't sleep. And so then on about 10 p.m., I climbed up in the dark to the saddle between this mountain and the other mountain. So it was between these two mountains, oops, right here. I was in between these two mountains. And you climb, you climb up from down here. So you climb up this stuff to get there. Uh, and, um, so I got to the saddle mid about midnight and I photographed the per Perseid meteor shower in the dark for, for about four hours. And it was about, it was about 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So it was pretty cold. And um, before sunrise, I hiked over to this mountain and got just absolutely lucky with some of the most amazing clouds and light that I've ever seen. So um, yeah, just an amazing experience uh, on zero sleep. 40 degree Fahrenheit means uh, it's about uh, five degree. By the way, um, for the for the people in India who cannot, you know, who are getting hard time, so five degree cold and sleeping on the top of the mountain with the wind chill, I have a feeling that it's, it's it has been pretty pretty rough for you and why you could not sleep and you know it's understandable probably. Yeah, and I could have done a better job of preparing myself with. I could have brought my sleeping bag up with me on the hike, but. You didn't have know. a sleeping bag on top of that. That's interesting. That's even no, more I didn't, interesting. <laughs> I didn't sleep. So I really, I just had like a puffy puppy jacket, long sleeve shirt, pants. Yeah, I wasn't, I just shivered for a few hours. No big deal, bro. Uh, Matt, Matt, was it a mix of technical, non-technical climb or was it a totally non-technical one? Yeah, so um, I'm not very technical at all to get to this one. Um, 
it looks like it would be technical, but uh, it's, I don't know, you're, you're walking, like the most technical it is to get to this point, you're, you're going through some boulder fields that require you to just be careful. Uh, but there's no rope or anything like that. Um, right. So your risk of death is relatively low. Right. <laughs> Only risk is hypothermia if you if, if it gets even colder or you know it probably gets rain. But at least you didn't have rain. I hope. It yeah. Didn't no. have rain. No, okay. It was good weather. I mean, the hardest part of this particular day was that after I was done photographing up here, I climbed the other mountain next to it. And that requires you to drop down about 1,500 feet of elevation and then wrap around the other side of it and then come back a bit. So you lose about 1,500 feet and then gain that 1,500 feet again. Um, and I was already just exhausted, uh, but I, I did it. That out, is out, of, that hurts. Like losing elevation and then coming back up. I think that's the most annoying part of, you know, of any hike, you know, tell me to climb, you know, tell me to go, uh, you know, go up in a mountain, which is like slowly climbing for eight hours, no problem. But if you lose an elevation and then come back again, then it feels like, why did I have to climb all the way up again and then lose and then climb up again? It feels so right. annoying. Well, and then on your way down, you're like thinking to yourself, I have to come back up this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, you always do that. You always yeah. think like that. Yeah, yeah it's fun. And what is the kind of camera bag that the, the, the uh, what kind of weight that you carry? Yeah, so for this one, uh, I was using a Osprey uh, Exos 40, 48. Um, and I was, I had, that was actually also my backpacking pack pack or bleh, backpack. So after I set up my campsite and stuff, then I reused my bag for all my camera gear and food and water to climb this. So for this one, I was still shooting Nikon and I was carrying, I, I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, I just had the two lenses for this climb. I had the Nikon 14 to 24 and the 24 to 70 F2.8. So, and, and a tripod. So I think my gear was, I was probably at about 10 pounds of camera gear plus food and water and clothes. So it wasn't crazy. The lenses are pretty heavy. The yeah, those two lenses. Was heavy. Backpack was pretty light, you know. I yeah, use the same backpack. The 14 to 24 is the heavy one. Yeah, it's both of them. It's a, both of them it's a beast. 24, 70. Yeah. yeah. Cool. You guys ready to move on? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. So this is a. This was the first one of the first trips I did with my new Sony setup. And I rafted uh, the Grand Canyon. So this is the Colorado River. And I rafted half of the, I did half of it um, just because I didn't have enough time off from work to do the whole thing. But uh, just again, represents a really amazing experience um, and also reminded me how scary it was to have all of my camera gear on the raft um, and while rafting the Grand Canyon, because it does get pretty crazy in spots, but I think these canyon walls are, you know, they're about a thousand to two thousand feet up from from here. So it was just a cool experience. I don't think it's like in a mind blowing photograph, but it was just one of my favorite experiences. Yep. Yeah. And does it like is there like any white water in the in the whole rafting uh, white water part or any like? Oh yeah. There are. Okay. Yeah. The, oh yeah. If, um, you should uh, you should YouTube like lava falls uh and grant yeah it's pretty hardcore <laughs> I and mean, what's wow. funny about this trip it was a, my very first rafting trip ever and i did the grand canyon which is any anyone who's done any rafting is probably just laughing and shaking their head because it's not exactly the the one you would think you would maybe maybe start on but whatever it was fun it was an awesome trip yeah i mean yeah i mean i from here it looks like it's like pretty placid and you know it's like really like peace, peaceful rafting or yeah the, you know Canyon Channel, but if there are rapids and waterfalls, then it must be. It must be That's hard. one of the cool things about the Colorado River is that you get stretches of like 15, 20 miles where it's just chill and calm, and then you get stretches where there's a lot of rapids. So you have kind of everything in between, and it um, usually people take about. I'm going to get this wrong, but usually I think people take about 20 days to do the trip, and I did half of it, so I think I did it in nine or ten or eleven days. I can't remember, but it was a cool trip. 
and how much did you like rap per day like how much mile um, i want to you know? say it depends on the day but it would average probably 30 miles a day miles. Wow. Yeah. i was <laughs> i was gonna say 10 miles but 30 miles is a lot yeah it could be way off like i said i don't do a lot of rafting so i well, can't I, remember I yeah i mean i trust you Ah, oh, I wouldn't. Not for this question. <laughs> cool. Uh, any other questions about this one? I think we can move. All right, cool. All right, so this is, um, again, another one of my favorite photographs and experiences as a photographer. This is Monument Valley. Um, and uh, to get to this particular location, you have to have a Navajo guide um, and you usually will stay overnight for one or two nights. It's not, it, a lot of people have been here before, but it's, it's a cool place because not a lot of people go there at the same time. They limit, they limit it pretty heavily in terms of volume. Um, and it's, if you've never been to this place before, just because of its history and the scenes that you see, it just feels very spiritual. Um, I don't know how else to put it. It's a, you feel connected to the land and to the history of the people and to the of the Navajo and that the lived there before us. And it's just a really cool place. And, you know, we had a Navajo guide and I spent some time just talking to him, try to understand the history and the culture. And that was a really fun experience, but uh, it was just a, a fun trip. I did this one with my buddy Kane and a few other people like um, Paul Rojas and, and, and a lot of other really cool photographers, uh, Adam. Anyway, it was a great trip. And I've actually got this photograph uh, tattooed as a sleeve. I don't know if you can, well, it's hard to see, but okay. it's tattooed on my arm. Um, so it's a, it was just a powerful experience and I loved being here. And compositionally speaking, I shot this with a telephoto lens and I really liked the way that the light was hitting the different parts of the canyons and rock features to kind of create an S-curve through the photo. Um, so yeah, I just really liked the experience you know? and the way the photo turned out. Hmm. So did you take a, like a hike from the Monument Valley kind of that uh, reservation or somewhere else or? No, you, you take a, it's a pretty insane four wheel drive road that they take you on up oh through sand and rocks. And it's, it's actually a pretty long drive up to this spot uh, to get here. It's, um, yeah, it's no, there's, there's almost no hiking involved at all. Like they pretty much drop you off within a few hundred yards of this spot. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, love, I love the visual flow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The shot Absolutely. is really unique from what I've seen from off Monument Valley. Definitely. Yeah, yeah I, I second you. Sucks so, me in. You. Sucks me right in. Thank you, yeah. I, I, um, it's very I, subtle uh, and the way light on this, this yeah, uh, highlights. Light view in, in, into the frame, it's amazing. It's, it's fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, I, I highly encourage anyone, if they can, to, to take a trip to this, to this place just because, uh, it is it is very special, and um, I think if you give it give it enough space and and think about it and try to experience it, you know, it'll have an it'll have an impact on you for sure. Certainly, uh, Matt. Yeah. I'd like to ask: uh, instead of that four wheel drive, uh, do you suggest, or is it possible to do a hike here? I don't think. I mean, I don't think you legally can. I think um, where you have to turn off to get to this place. The Navajo Nation, because this is in re this is in the reservation, and they they do a pretty good job of um, keeping people out of it. So unless you're with a Navajo guide, uh, you you well you shouldn't go here without a guide. And um, I think hiking to this place from the road would be it would be a crazy hike. It would just be a very long hike in the desert. Um, <laughs> It would, it would take a while. I can't remember the exact mileage. Uh, I could probably go back and look on the map, but it's it's a pretty significant drive in. Okay. No wonder they have a four wheel drive. Yeah, no. Yeah, and the road is crazy because it's like on these weird angles, and it's there's these huge sections of of sand that you can get stuck in, and the guys that drive it 
they just know the place. They just have driven it so many times. They, they know how to do it in the way that probably a tourist would, they would get stuck. I guarantee it. There would be so many people getting towed here. It would be crazy. <laughs> You'd see many vans. Yeah. It's a pretty wild place. It's there is like, you know, it, there is, it looks like it has been, you know, it is the time from the time when the America was still being built, you know, from the land. Yeah. It has a prehistoric feeling in that place. And yes. yeah. And, yeah. Matt, a uh, quick one from YouTube for you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, now, given that you backpack and you probably stay overnight at quite a few places, how, how do you carry power along with you, uh, you know, for the camera and everything? Yeah, yeah. that's a great question. So um, I switched to Sony back in 2017 um, and I was shooting the A7R2 which has absolutely horrible batteries. If anyone has ever shot with the, the A7R1 or the two or the A7, the A7 or the A7 II, those batteries are just complete crap. <laughs> so, yes. so I, instead of carrying like 40 batteries of Sony, I actually, what I used to do is I would carry like four or five of those batteries, which they don't weigh hardly anything. But then I would also carry uh, one of those, anchor, I don't have it in front of me, but it's one of those little anchor power Called, I think it's called a core power, anchor core power. Um, it's like USB power and oh, you can actually, what's that? Like the battery pack, the thick battery pack. Yeah, they're, you know, they're like a candy bar. Right. They're clearly like a candy bar. They're, they're a little bit heavy, but you know, you can, I think, I think I've done the math on it. You could recharge your battery on your camera like 30 times yeah. on one of those. And I also use it to chart, keep my phone charged because I like to use my phone for GPS and also it has an alarm clock. So, um, yeah, I, I don't I don't do any backpacking trips without a battery pack. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Cool. Move on. Yeah, yeah. All right. Sweet. So this is uh, another image I took on another backpacking trip here in Southwest Colorado. Um, this is actually. Uh, those two mountains I was showing you earlier yeah. from, uh, where was that? It's actually these two mountains here, oh. this one and this one. Yeah. Uh, but it's from a different vantage point. And uh, this was actually kind of serendipitous. I was, uh, this, I backpacked up here with my wife for her birthday. And uh, while she was, um, taking a nap one afternoon, I hiked up to the top of this kind of 12,500 foot little peak and got out photo pills. The, I don't know if you're familiar with photo pills, the yeah. application, and it has a, it has an augmented reality uh, tool on it. And I was like, I wonder where the Milky Way is <laughs> tonight. And I pulled it up and I was like, Oh my God, the Milky Way is going to be right above Vestal and Arrow, these two mountains. So I was like, I guess I know what I'm doing at 2 AM. So set my alarm for 1 a.m. and hiked up here in the cold and set it up. And uh, this is actually a 55 millimeter. So it's two single exposures, uh, one, for the, one for the Milky Way and one for the foreground. There was absolutely zero moonlight at all uh, for this shot. So I had to expose the foreground for, I want to say it was like F5.6 uh, for um, uh, ISO 1600 for like four minutes or something like that. It was a pretty long exposure of the foreground just to get it to, to show. But um, yeah, it's one of my favorite um, and most popular images. And like you were saying, Atsunu earlier, I don't, there's not a lot of people that are gonna copy this one. I mean, it's not that definitely hard to get not. to this spot. Nobody's gonna, but it's, definitely not. <laughs> um, I mean, it's definitely I mean, doable, but. Yeah, I mean, that requires some, some resolve. Yeah. What was that? I said that requires some resolve, some some determination. Uh, uh, yeah, I thought you. I thought you meant you're a little. You have to be a little bit crazy. <laughs> kind of the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will say, as I get older. Um, it becomes a little bit harder to motivate 
<laughs> to do this, even though this was a, a three years ago, I shot this, but yeah. yeah, it's becoming harder and harder to get the motivation, but uh, it is what it is, especially, especially if you're shooting, you know, you, I don't know if you guys do this too, but typically I'll shoot sunset and then you'll shoot the Milky Way and then you'll shoot sunrise. And then it's like, when do you sleep? You know, it's, you're sacrificing sleep somewhere. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions for this one? I think. Is, I mean, yeah, and is it like um, it looks like you know it as if it has the same details like a track Milky Way, and that's that's amazing. Was it? Yeah. And you said it was not tracked, right? It was. No. Yeah. No tracking. Uh, single exposure. ISO ten thousand at f two point two for ten seconds. Wow. And what is the city behind that? Behind the mountain? I can feel that. Yeah, light. that's light pollution, probably from a, from Farmington, New Mexico, which is about a 30 minute drive south of here. And it's oh. it's a town of about, I don't know, 100,000, maybe 80,000. So it's not terrible light pollution, but I think it kind of adds a little too. I don't, I don't yeah, mind it. Slight light pollution on the horizon always adds to the Milky Way. It kind of separates the yeah. foreground. That 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 feels nice. Yeah, I like it too. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Matt, again, question coming in from YouTube from Senthil, who's who's been pretty much like one of our ardent followers. Awesome. Like, yeah. So it's coming from Senthil. And very good question. So when, when you pick your colors, or at least basically amplify the contrast and the saturation in the Milky Way, uh, how, do you, how do you do the white balance and the saturation balance? That's a great it? question, uh, because I think a lot of um, night photographers struggle with color. Uh, because, And there's lots of different opinions and stances on color about the night sky that, that exist. Uh, there's actually a guy named um, Roger Clark, clarkvision.com, where he's all about the scientific accuracy of what color should look like in the night sky. And he thinks it should be like super warm and lo lo lots of orange and red. Uh, but, that, but that's not how we see the night sky, right? And that's not how we experience the night sky as human beings. And obviously our camera sensors experience it slightly differently than that. So, so my goal is always to try to um, approximate what my experience was um, as best as I can. And that usually entails trying to get the dark areas to look uh, either gray or black. Uh, so I'm more focused on what the color is in the non Milky Way parts of the sky uh, to make them more neutral. So if you notice that your Milky Way or the night sky has like blue or red or orange or purple, then to me that starts to look a little funky. And I used to do a lot of that too, so I get it. Um, so I, I tend to be either on the cooler side because I think uh, color, color is a way to also um, convey an experience. Um, and usually when you're shooting the night sky, it's cold. So I'm either, a little bit cooler than most people um, or neutral. And then to answer the question on, you know, contrast and whatnot, typically all I'm doing with the Milky Way layer is um, doing a little bit of work in luminosity masks um, on um, midtones and highlights to bring out contrast uh, using curves. So I'm not usually doing a ton of manipulation to that just to kind of make it stand out a little bit more from the night sky itself. Interesting. Well put, Matt, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure, no yeah. problem. We mm -hmm. ready to, oh, yeah. go ahead. Please. Yeah. Move on, all right, cool. <laughs> okay. Wow. So this is uh, mm -hmm. another one of my favorite panoramas. And uh, what this photograph for me represents is a, is a kind of a shift in my photography. Uh, so this was taken in, oh, I don't want to get it wrong. Mm, I want to say it was 2017. Let's look at the library. I should know. I want to make sure. Yeah, 2017, autumn. And basically for me, this was a seminal moment um, mentally 
uh, that kind of has shifted my photography a little bit from what it, from what I used to ch um, try to do. And what I mean by that is that, uh, and then I think my experience will explain that. So this, this photograph was taken in fall, which I almost every fall I'll do a fall colors trip here in Colorado. Um, and typically what I used to do before this is I would have a shot list in mind where before I would even leave the house, I would have all of these iconic shots in my mind that I wanted to go take. So, you know, I would have a shot list of, of places I wanted to go and photos I would want to take that other people have already taken uh, that I thought would look that I also wanted to take. And there's nothing wrong with that approach, but yeah. I found it, it was starting to just not fill my soul, I guess, as a photographer. And so I remember one morning I got to this location down that below in this valley below me here to the right. And I was going to shoot sunrise of this. And it's a very popular scene. Lots of people have the photo from this spot down below in the valley. And the light wasn't that good. And I was just like this. I've shot this scene before. Um, it's nothing. I'm not going to get anything new or different. And I just that just didn't resonate for me. So I looked on my map and I was like, well, there's a trail over here that goes up to this place I've never been to before. I have no idea. If it's gonna, if there's a good view there or not, I've never seen a photo from up there before, so it could be a total waste of time. But I'm just gonna take my camera gear up this trail and I'm gonna see what it's like. And man, I got to the top of this trail and hiked along this long ridge, and got rewarded with this crazy view that you see here, uh, which includes uh, that photo, that mountain that we talked about earlier, Uncompahgre Peak. Uh, we've talked two two of my images have had that featured before, and that's this mountain here. That's on Compagre Peak. It's a fourteener, and I had no idea that you could see it from this spot. I was just I was like, wow, there's on Compagre. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, for me it was it just represents an experience that then started to shape or reshape how I think about approaching photography, um, and also turned out to be a really great photograph. Um, and there's there's a whole other funny story about this this image too that I can go into if you want um, that I think is kind of fun but uh, what questions do you have based on what I already talked about yeah go ahead okay cool it. so uh, the trail to get up here um, it's a pretty short trail but it's steep I want to say it's it's about three miles and about 1500 feet of elevation gain it's not crazy but you're coming up down from this valley down here in fact you can see the road right there that you that you hike up from oh. and uh so i i got up to this vantage point to what you're seeing here and this thunderstorm that you see come in the background starts coming and i was like i'm going to get struck by lightning if i don't go back down so i hiked about halfway all the way back down again down the trail with all my camera gear and then i noticed the clouds were starting to part and on the west this amazing light was starting to come back in. So I climbed all the way back up again and shot it at sunset and just got it just in time. The photos for that one aren't as good as this one in my opinion, but it was still just one of those ridiculous, ridiculous experiences where I put myself through excruciating pain because I was like, I didn't want to miss out on a great photograph. Uh, so it's just one of those things that reminds me of kind of just dumb decisions that I make to get photographs. <laughs> I say dumb. I mean, it might inspire other people, but I look back at it and I'm like, God, that was a lot of work. Also, I'd, li I'd like to ask uh, Matt uh, that during these kind of uh, experiences, it's a process of self-discovery as well. Right. So uh, yeah. uh, what would be uh, your uh, uh, day of self-discovery or day of discovering yourself as uh, something fresh? or as something new, because mm -hmm. I have had my share of experiences. So you always do in these kind of situations or in these kind of treks or trails or hikes, whatever you Yeah, I mean, I would say it's, for me, it's kind of a blending of approaches. So in order to get to the places like this, you do have to do some amount of planning, but you also don't want to get so bogged down in, a uh, preconceived idea that you're not going to be open and willing to look for and or go to 
different places that may or may not yield a good photograph. So to me, a lot of a lot of that is becoming more open minded around um, or not tying yourself to an expectation. So for me, the first step is to completely eliminate any expectations I might have for a photograph to be made, uh, which then frees you up to then go to places that you might see on the map or see in the distance that you're like, that you might be curious about. So that I, often for me, it's like the photograph in my background, for example, that was one of those situations where I was in this basin, backpacked up there. I saw this point. I I looked at it on the map and I thought, I think there could be an interesting photograph to be made up there, but it also might not at all. So I need to be open to the idea that I'm going to put in some work and not get a good photograph. And trust me, for every good photograph I'm showing you, there's 20 others that suck. So, so, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of failure that's involved in that process as well, but I don't necessarily think about those things as failures. I think about them as learning opportunities. So I think a lot of it's just uh, having a different mindset. If that, hopefully that answers your question. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So Matt, I have a question. Uh, uh, looking at the series of panels that we've seen, uh, starting from the first one, we had the horizon in pretty much the center of the image. And right. now we've come to a more uh, balanced uh, composition where the sky is uh, maybe one fourth of the image. Um, is that a conscious thing or is it just a compositional uh, is there an evolution in this is what my question is i think yes all of the above i think so for for some of it it's and i think a lot of photographers struggle with this especially when you're photographing beautiful clouds it's how much of that do i want to include and how much of that is the subject uh so i also think some of it has become more of a conscious compositional um decision for me uh, as I progress as a photographer, I spend a little bit more time thinking about composition, especially in relation to panoramas. Uh, so I think it's a, it's yes to everything you just said. <laughs> All of the above. And, and is, there, is there a plan to do multi-row panels for a Vista like this? Because this seems to be tailor-made to do something uh, in a multi-row. It's funny you should ask. I actually have been back to this location uh, for Milky Way um, and it works okay. Uh, I need to go back in the summer uh, because this is kind of facing south. And when I was last there, um, it was more autumn and the, you know, the Milky Way orientation doesn't work necessarily as well for a panorama in autumn. So, so yes, I would love to go back to this spot. In fact, I might go back there in a couple of weeks to see if I can do a, a night panel here, although I don't know if the moon's going to cooperate. Oh, we'll mm -hmm. give it a shot. So, yes. You would get a quote above that mountain, like rising angular way. That would be nice if it is facing south. Yeah, and that, that's a little bit more southeast. Okay. And so over on the right is southwest. OK. Because this is actually a telephoto panorama, so I think this was seventy millimeter. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. Which I think is also something not a lot of people experiment with. Yeah. I yeah. love I love yeah. doing uh, telephoto panoramas. You can do some really yeah, interesting different, stuff. Different. Yeah. Same here, Matt. Same here. Yeah. Cool. Ready to move on? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So this is uh, another image from Bistai Badlands. Um, it, I think it kind of tells a story a little bit uh, because these two rock hoodoos, I think kind of look like people. Some people have told me it kind of looks like E.T. from the movie E.T. E. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually titled it E.T. Phone Home. Uh, but it kind of looks like they're you know looking into the, the stars um, and wanting to go back to their home planet. Yeah. So I just kind of like the story it conveys, but uh, this was a fun, fun one to do. It represents about five and a half hours of Earth rotation. So, um, and I did it. I, I was actually asleep <laughs> when I did it. So I set my camera up. 
Um, this was actually the Sony A7R2 and a Nikon 14 to 24. And I set it up and then I, I went back to my tent, which was about a mile away. Went oh. to sleep for a few hours. Why you back. <laughs> So that's why one thing I do like about Star Trails is that you can do it while you're sleeping. <laughs> uh, weren't you worried about your batteries, or did you have so, a, yeah, a auxiliary power? So yeah, I had a, a, a anchor, the power core connected to the to the camera, powering it. So so yeah, that's another advantage oh. of using one of those power cores and using the Sony system is you can you can externally power it while while yeah. it's shooting. I think you can do it with other cameras too, but it involves a little bit more work. Yeah, uh, I don't think Nikon has a has a Nikon system. You could get some third-party systems to do that. But I think Nikon is also coming out with now. Um, uh, I think everybody is now coming out with these this particular feature. Yeah, but the problem with the Z6 and the Z7, the problem is that uh, you cannot shoot while you are powering it or you are right. charging it. You'll have, yeah, you'll have to switch it off. But I think yeah. uh, I think they are about to come out with something which should have now. Because now well, all it's, everybody it's, has it. It's just a firm, firmware up, uh, yeah, update. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Nikon should do it for Z6 yeah. and Z7. Yeah, I think it's honestly when I, so when I switched from Nikon to Sony in 2017, that particular feature was one of the key reasons I chose Sony. Um, yeah. Because I knew, because I knew I could lighten my camera system a little bit and um, make us have a smaller kit for backpacking, and I could also not worry about batteries while backpacking for several days because I could power it while I'm shooting and things like that. So it is a feature that I heavily considered as a as a as a selling point. I don't use it a lot, but. It is helpful. Yeah. Uh, you have it. You know that you have it, and that is a big, big thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Any okay. uh, Great. anything else? No, I feel that the colors Maybe. have been come out nice, and of all the stars and all, it's, it's lovely. lovely. Well, Thanks. the placement of the elements are, is just Good. absolutely yeah. perfect. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Spot on. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun, and uh, you know, it's just one of those things. Like you research, you know, once you get to know the night sky, think about the relationship between where objects are in the sky and elements in the foreground. I think that's the, that's the definition of astro, astro landscape photography is trying to figure out the best way to combine those elements. So, uh, You got this on the first attempt itself or you had to go for a couple of visits? No, no, this is first try. Awesome. Yeah. Very nice. Cool. Couple more. So this is a. Uh, this was from my first and only trip to Iceland, and the very first time I ever photographed the uh, the aurora. aurora. And you know, it's not the most technically perfect image. You can see these uh, rocks are out of focus in the foreground, but uh, it was an amazing experience. I don't. If you've never experienced photographing the aurora, it especially when it's like these, these things, man, like they're dancing in the sky and yeah. it's yeah. just mind blowing. And so it just represents one of my favorite moments as a photographer. Like I said, not the perfect image, but it was awesome to be able to see it and photograph it and experience it. And I think that's one of my favorite things about landscape photography is that it can take you back to those experiences you've had. Mm. And, and um, you didn't do uh, focus check on this one, Matt? I didn't. Uh, honestly, so, you know, before I did this trip in 27 or 2018, I did this trip. You know, I had a lot of experience photographing the night sky, but photographing the aurora is different. Um, <laughs> it's way different. Uh, and I knew that going into it, but uh, I was completely unprepared mentally to make the switch, I guess, to doing longer exposures. So, you know, you're cranking your ISO and doing like four second shots. And honestly, I was so concerned about shutter speed that I completely forgot to focus stack anything. So, it was, and, and I was just so blown away by what was happening uh, yeah. that, you know, I just, my photography stuff was like so secondary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. We've yeah. all been there. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. You know. Yeah. It happens like, you know, whenever I saw the past horror, that same thing happened to me as well. Like, you know, like you forgot everything. Right. Like, it just creates a, that, you know, unexplained sensation of joy in your mind that, you know, you forget everything. Oh my God, like it what's does. happening in that, in a sense. It does. And, you know, I don't know what your experience was, but for me, it was like, oh, it's right there. Cool. And then you get your shot yeah. set up and it's moved and you're like, oh, I got to set. So like, not only are you, are you mentally, you know, just blown away by what you're experiencing, it's really hard to keep up a composition. It's like moving that. very yeah. fast. So, yeah. 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 It's child. It's a lot harder than it looks. Yeah. yeah. At least it was for me. I don't know. No, definitely. I mean, I could. Right. It's not like the Milky Way that just kind of sits there. <laughs> sure. Right. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, can we move, want to move on? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. All right. Sweet. All right. So this is a, this doesn't necessarily represent what I believe to be like, um, it's a great, great photograph necessarily in terms of a landscape photograph, but it definitely represents for me, a place and an experience that uh, I never want to forget about. So this particular photograph was taken on the top of Thunder Pyramid, which is a very difficult mountain to climb in Colorado. And it was my final uh, centennial. So my final 100th mountain in the highest mount 100. So it, it like this moment in time encapsulates basically a lifetime goal of me wanting to climb the highest hundred mountains in Colorado. So, and it also just happens to contain some of the most amazing mountains in Colorado, including Pyramid Peak, which is a 14er over here. It also includes the Maroon Bells, which a lot of people may be familiar with the Maroon Bells. It's a very iconic scene that people usually photograph from right. the parking lot and the lake at Maroon Lake. And there's a famous Ansel Adams photograph of the Maroon Bells. Uh, but it also contains these two 14ers back here, including Snowmass Peak and Capitol Peak. So, and you can see just, this is the kind of rock you're climbing up. It's very loose um, uh, dinner plate type stuff is how I like to describe it. So you step on it and it all just kind of slides around and moves beneath you. And when you're climbing up these steep slopes, like this is the route you climb up from down here. Like you start way down in this valley and you have to climb up all this stuff to get here. And it, it is very, this climb is dangerous. There's, there have been many people that have died on this climb. So, um, but yeah, it, uh, and it's, well, it's a beautiful place too. Yeah. So. I, I was about to ask what has been your toughest uh, hike or climb. So this would surely be one, one of them. You know, I would say this is definitely in the top 10. I don't know if it's in the top five, but there's a, there's a, interestingly, this one and another one called Gladstone, which is also in Southwest Colorado here. They're both difficult and dangerous, not because of the technical necess requirements. They're just, it's very loose rock that's unstable that mm. if you're not careful, it can slide and you can cause a rock fall and and get really hurt and so those two are ch challenging uh this mountain back here which uh, is called capital peak is also pretty difficult it doesn't require rope but this i don't know if you can see where my mouse is but this yes. little section right here is called the knife edge mm. um you can actually youtube that you can google it lots of people like to gopro that section it's called the knife edge of capital peak it's pretty hair raising uh it's fun it's not super dangerous but lots of people have died on that mountain as well um i think these two mountains over here the maroon bells they're they're also very difficult again they don't require rope but they're very challenging and um, there's a lot of ways to get injured and hurt on those ones I think from a technical perspective, the one that was probably the three that were hardest is um, Jagged Mountain, which is uh, this one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's a little fuzzy, 
the this mountain yeah jagged mountain that one was probably one of the hardest ones because it, it does have several pitches of rope climbing and route finding that's challenging uh this mountain over here called vestal peak which is one of my favorite mountains and i'll show you another photograph of it later is also technically difficult so those are kind of the, the main ones i think that are more difficult Sorry, another long-winded answer. Thanks. Thanks. No, I think that, that makes sense. I mean, people have you know people have died even in angels landing too. I mean, I don't have any comparison scale like how angels landing uh, stands on compared to this. But you know, I think the unpreparedness people go. That's I think the main reason. Some people are really unprepared and like they push really hard beyond their capabilities what they can do. And that's I think that one of the reason that why they fall off or you know like that. Yeah, I mean. I actually used to do a ton of research on mountain mountaineering deaths in Colorado, and I, kissed, I would actually wrote an annual article about every death in Colorado, which was oh, actually wow. very difficult to do. But what I learned through that is that there's typically two types of people, or not people, but two types of scenarios where people are dying. It's usually people that are new or inexperienced that are unprepared and or make really bad mental errors, which I've done my fair share of. And then the other is uh, people that are more experienced that put themselves, they've overestimate their abilities and they put themselves into dangerous situations that they were overly confident about. So those are probably 75% of the deaths involve one of those two scenarios. Great. Not has, to has get, it, yeah. go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say not to get morbid, but that's yeah. typically what happens. Yeah, uh, so uh, the next question is, has it so happened that you uh, dropped an idea or you uh, came back halfway through uh, without completing a task or without completing what you have decided to go for? Or oh, it? yeah. Like, how often do I make a plan to, to make, make a photograph or climb a mountain and it doesn't, all right, I don't do it. I can't do it. Yeah, yeah, is that yeah. the question? Yes. Yeah. Uh probably less often than it should uh i think i think i'm i've just gotten to be very realistic about what i'm able to do and not able to do so i think a lot of times if the weather doesn't look right or something i'm usually fairly conservative and i won't attempt it um so it doesn't happen a ton but you know, it does happen from time to time. I, maybe the definition, my definition is a little bit different because usually what will happen for me is I'll be in an area and I'll have a photo in mind, but then I won't try it because of the conditions or whatever. So I think we might be trying to say the same thing, but that's... Right, right, right. I, I totally get that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Uh, All right. Why are you like, switching on the next images? Uh, so... so just trying to understand the gods that you know risk or difficulty so how how does it stand like how does this climb stand on the riskiness beyond um compared to angel's landing does it a lot more difficult like is it a lot more difficult or risky well i've never done angel's landing so um i don't know if i can give you an accurate comparison there but oh, that's, that's all right um, but yeah, yeah people people it's very popular so i thought that it might be might be a, yeah, a it's um it's hard to describe if you've never done climbing in Colorado because it is a little bit different than uh, most places in the world. Because I you know, like in the Himalayas, your your risks are more related to elevation yeah. and you know snow and glacier travel, which is a completely different style yeah. of climbing, right? I mean, those those risks typically aren't what you're faced with here. Most people that die on the mountains in Colorado die because they fall um, or oh. because of rock fall. So, and usually falls occur. So like if we look at this particular photograph as an example, um, this is a typical, this, is a, this would be a typical kind of route that you might take on a more difficult climb in Colorado up this, up this ridge, yeah. which does involve some hand over hand and route finding and there's loose rock. So what typically what would happen to somebody is you'll get up to a spot and you might make the wrong decision on which rock to put your weight on. That rock falls and then you fall. 
So that's typically where the difficulty is. And then I think the other difficulty is, is that you're also gaining, you know, typically between two and 5,000 feet of elevation in the process. And you're, and you're getting to an elevation where there's significantly less oxygen than sea level. So you're more exhausted, um, physically exhausted. And so in terms of difficulty, I, I'm sure it's a lot harder than Angel's Landing, but it's a lot easier than say climbing Denali or him, anything in the Himalayas. Right. Like um, most mountains so, in yeah, Colorado, story. most mountains in Colorado is basically like um, hiking to base camp in Mount Everest, honestly. Cool, ready to move on? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so this is Capitol Peak. I think I pointed it out to you on my previous photograph. Mm -hmm. And um, this is this is that knife edge I was describing to you guys before where people have fun. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is a really cool story. Uh, I've always wanted to get a very unique photograph of Capitol Peak in autumn. So my buddy Kane and I did a lot of research on the map and found an area to backpack into uh, that had some interesting vantage points to include fall color, but then also of Capitol Peak. So we backpacked into this area and then we hiked over to this other area, which is about two miles away and set up for sunset. And this storm had kind of been blowing through all day long and it looked like the sunset was gonna be a complete dud there's tons of clouds on the horizon, but then at the very last second, the clouds broke to the west. And you know, I don't know if you guys have this experience ever, but sometimes you'll get that bounce light off of the clouds that then kind of creates even more powerful color and light on the rock. And um, I did enhance the colors of this a little bit in Photoshop using luminosity masks, uh, just because I wanted to accentuate the red but that red color was definitely there. Um, this is a matter of, matter of personal choice, I guess. Uh, yeah. But it was a real moment, a real experience. And um, yeah, I don't know if you can see it, but I actually have that scene photographed on my upper arm up here uh, as well. So, okay. uh, so I just wow. uh, it's maybe not um, the best photo in the world, but it's one of my it's one of my favorite photographs and moments and represents one of my favorite mountains in Colorado, I mean, one of my favorite mountain climbs. So. It's quite amazing. Awesome, awesome. awesome. And uh, apparently you have quite a few uh, of your images of your of the mountains that you shoot tattooed on to yourself. <laughs> yes, uh, I've got a couple, uh, like this one I was showing you. Well, how, how are you doing on the real estate, man? Uh, <laughs> well, this, ar this arm's full. Um, it's a full sleeve uh, and comes all the way up up to here. Got your back full as well? Your back? No, 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 no. Just just my left arm. And then I have one tattoo ah, here plenty. on my right arm. And then you have so the that, head as that's well. That's all. Nothing, nothing on the head, nothing on the neck, <laughs> nothing on my legs. The scalp. So I, I still have plenty of, plenty of real estate. <laughs> Leave some for the Himalayas when you're here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about that one? I think we move. Yeah, good. I can move. Cool. Um, well, I got one more. Yeah. And um, actually, photographed this one two weeks ago. So this is actually first time anyone else has seen this image for the first time. It's kind of cool, oh. right? Yeah, yeah. Um so this is uh this is those two mountains I was telling you about before that I have in lots of my photographs and I actually have tattooed on my arm. This is Vestal Peak right here. This is called Wham Ridge. Shows you a little bit more of the the vertical profile. It's a little bit less vertical than you would imagine. Um but when you get up into the into these sections of it, it it is it does get to be somewhat technical and you do want a rope. Um but uh, in order to, to get to this spot, this was a 30 mile backpacking trip. 
um, for this cool. trip uh, to get here. And then I'm actually, I don't know if I can show you this accurately. Well, I guess it doesn't matter, but um, I'm actually about halfway up another mountain called uh, West Trinity Peak uh, when I photographed this scene and it was really nasty rock to get up to this spot. No trail, just, just climbing up this crazy boulder field and nasty rock. But I wanted to get, um, I pretty much accomplished what I wanted. I wanted to get a photo of Vestal Peak at sunset with a sun star, some nice clouds, and I wanted the foreground to have some nice glow to it on the rocks and I was able to get that. So, uh, but yeah, it's a very difficult place to get to. Um, and I've actually, last year I made it a goal to, I wanted to get back to this place again, but actually not be physically, so physically exhausted that I didn't want to take photographs. Cause I went here in 2017 and I was just, I was so tired and exhausted. I didn't want to take photos. It was that bad. I mean, it's, it's really hard to do. So literally since the start of COVID um, in March, every single day, sorry, every single day, I have an exercise routine that I do. Um, there's a trail about five minutes away from my house that ascends um, about 600 steps. And I do, I go up and down that twice. Um, and that's my workout that I do every day. It takes me about 25 minutes. And it's got my legs into a lot better shape and my, my lungs are in better shape. So, but it's enabled me to, 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 make, to make images like this. So it's worth Thanks it. This is one wonderful, beautiful image. Thanks. Yeah, it's um how did you it's one of my favorite places. places. Like how did you like came to know that you know like you wanted to be this oh actually I guess you know you had a like general area in mind and I understand that part that the sun would come to come to this point. Yeah, I mean I've I've been obsessed with this area of Colorado for a decade. I actually have uh, the map that has this whole area and the uh, um, that you know many of the photos I have. I have that map printed up really big and large in my office, so I look at it all the time. And I look at you know I'm like oh, there's that ridge. I bet if this time of year, looking this way, that could be an interesting photo. So it's um, I think it's just a matter of being in love with a place and wanting to showcase it as best I can through photos. Cool. cool. Well, that's the, those are the ones I picked out for you. Yeah. Amazing collection. Amazing. That was just great. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. So I think, I think we can stop the screen share and we can get into the question answer session. Yeah. Just a minute. Yeah. Cool. That that was some amazing experience, Matt. And um, um, on a on a lighter note, I would like to just hope and pray. I would like to say that we would hope and pray that you don't stop photography uh, after even after your arms get full of those tattoos. <laughs> you can continue to do that. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, they, they were some amazing. And because see, what what makes your images special is the kind of um, as you mentioned that the reward that 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 you get after after uh, doing so much of hard work and um, i had some, some something in my mind uh, but there is uh, one particular question coming exactly like that by utpal deka on, on youtube is asking that how do you convince your family when you tell them that you're going to climb scary peaks for the pictures can you give us some tips <laughs> You know, I think uh, early on in my mountain climbing days, my wife was pretty concerned about it. Uh, but I think she, she hears me talk a lot about safety and, you know, the various experiences I've had. And I think she just trusts that I make good decisions. Um, she did finally convince me in the last year to, to get a Garmin inReach, uh, which has two-way text communications um, via GPS which I have started to use this year just to, just to check in to say, hey, yep, I'm still alive. Um, 
So I think it's just a matter of time and trust, honestly. Uh, she does want to know where I'm, where I'm going, where I, the general area that I'm going to be in. But for the most part, I don't really tell her, hey, this is what I'm doing. I think she knows that I'm going to do it as safely as I possibly can. Um, and honestly, I don't think it bothers her too much anymore. But, but she's never been with you? Um... Or no, she's school? not in, she's not into it, man. Not okay. like this. Yeah, I mean she'll hike into these basin into these basins and stuff with me like on a like a two-day overnight backpack if it's easy. But yeah, no, she doesn't want to go up any higher. She's good. She's like, oh no, I can see the mountain from here. I'm good. Hard <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, do you take your dog sometimes with you? Or any of the tough, tough climbs or you know, hikes? take who take your dog oh no man my dog is she's old she's like 16 oh, um, oh. even when she was a puppy I, I i did take her on one climb uh back in like 2007 and she did not do very well off leash so i thought it's just you know especially if you get around people and you, if your voice if your dog isn't under voice command um, yeah. It just becomes a safety hazard for other people to bring your dog with you. So yeah. I just don't do that. Yeah. Um, Matt, I, um, I I would like to tell our, our audience today that you are very, very strict about the code of ethics. And I think that I would like to um, ask you one question regarding that so because you are very particular about those those code of, code of ethics that you, that you follow and you mentioned that in your presentation also today uh, but tell us something more about it and, and maybe what are those code of ethics and maybe also a little bit about your nature first initiative sure so you know growing up um, going to these places with my parents I was lucky because they were able to instill an appreciation of these places to me at a young age and give me some education around um, how to how to treat these places with respect. So, you know, I learned early on, we would go to campsites that had been completely trashed by other people with trash and broken bottles and, and, and burnt metal and stuff in camp rings and extra fire rings made and trees being shot up with guns and so they were just very vocal with me at an early age and they would get me involved in cleaning campsites up and so i just grew an appreciation of my this these are the places that i love and i want to be able to experience them in the nat most natural state that i possibly can without human interference if at all possible and I want other people to have that experience as well. And I think the only way that we can ensure that that happens is to do the best we can to try to adhere to a set of ethical standards. And that, that is essentially how Nature First Photography started. So uh, about three years ago now, two and a half years ago, uh, a photographer in Estes Park, Colorado named Eric Stensland assembled a, a group of about 10 of us in Ridgeway, Colorado, to have a, a conversation about what we were seeing as photographers in some of our favorite places and an increasing trend of not only visitation, but also the impact of that visitation and some of the ramifications of what the growing popularity of landscape photography and of certain places is having on those places. So um, we spent a lot of time thinking about what some of the root causes to those problems were. And, uh, it was a really great exercise. There was not complete agreement through the process. There was a lot of go back and forth between a lot of us. Um, so the principles that you see today in Nature First, and there's seven of them, and I don't necessarily know that I want to read them to you, but you can go to naturefirstphotography.org uh, to check that out. Uh, but essentially, those principles were born out, of, born out of those problems that we were thinking about and how to address those problems but we wanted to do it in a more positive way. So you'll see it's very intentional around the language being used. It's all about what you should do, not what you shouldn't do. Uh, and we're trying not to be in your face about it. You know, we don't, we don't think it's very effective for people to be shamed on the internet 
um, even though that's human tendency, like, oh, you, you're a jerk and you did these things. Um, it feels good sometimes to do that, but it's not typically very effective. I think what we found to be more effective is to slowly grow an awareness of the problems and to give people an outlet or a uh, framework by which to operate so that they can begin to change their habits. I will admit that even for me, I often struggle with some of the nature first principles in practice. Like I constantly have to remind myself of things like, hey man, think about this one before you post that or hey, maybe you should talk about the fragility of the location you're at before you share the image. So I even struggle with it and I understand it's not, it doesn't come naturally. So it's not meant to be a, well, you better do these things or else you're a bad person. It's not meant to be that at all. It's meant to be a, something for, all, for us all to strive towards. That's great. So uh, guys, I'll leave this uh, um, link to uh, Nature First in the description down below. So you can just go and check. It's a wonderful initiative that he's done. Very few photographers um, that I know um, have, uh, have been conscious of the fact that we have to be responsible photographers. Um, and it is very difficult. Yes, as he, as he rightly mentioned, he's not even ashamed to uh, put it across very openly and accepting that it is not easy even for a person like him who advocates that and who has taken up taken this up as an initiative. Uh, so hats off to you, Matt. Uh, that is that requires some kind of resolve. Uh, so guys, well, thanks. I mean, yeah. I think you know. I mean, not you know. Talk a little bit about the the dark side of that for a second. Um, yeah. But yeah. you know, whenever you put yourself out there as being behind something like that. It kind of puts a target on your back for people. And I've, I've experienced that. I mean, if when I post a photograph of a place and I say where it's at, people are like, oh, you're, you're violating your principles. And, yeah. you know, people, and I, it's, it's, it's not an easy um, thing to do to try to hold yourself to a higher standard. Yeah. And, and I, and I still make mistakes too. So, um, it's yeah, not easy, but, but but it's worth, but it's it's worth trying. Doing, yeah, you're still doing something which is phenomenal, which is phenomenal. Guys, anybody has any question? Because I have I have one important question that I want to ask, and we have already run beyond a couple of hours. So yeah. okay, no, no, I no. wanted to say sorry, Matt, because uh, I was up till four a.m. in the morning and not in good shape <laughs> to be on video. So I just I heard every every single thing you said. It was an awesome session. And I really like what you guys, uh, what you are doing. And yeah, I also believe on not sharing the locations because I have also seen places which have, have been cordoned and uh, messed up like anything. So yeah, I also believe in the same thing. So yeah, keep going and take risk, but safely love the images. Thank you. Okay. I, I remember, um, I remember one, one, once I, um, uh, I think it was an it was an image backstage image of me taken uh, during Iceland tour uh, that I was talking about that the barricading is being done in, in Iceland and we have to respect that and I was talking about it that we have to respect all this and we should not cross that and then um, somebody from our group only um, um, posted an image of me uh, clicking using a tripod with one leg of the tripod crossing beyond that rope. So <laughs> it was, it was quite funny. It was not easy. At times you do certain things um, um, unintentionally as well. So I think it's okay as far as you have your, your intentions are at the right uh, uh, place. Uh, I wanted to ask something which is, which has, I've been trying to ask this uh, from many um, speakers earlier. Um, but this is pertaining to landscape photography. Um, so today when we see that, um, I just jotted down the question just to ensure that I don't digress. Uh, I do digress a lot at times. So, uh, well, you're not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> today we, um, uh, what once a unique location or an image that we, that we, that we see has already been shot to death. Um, this, this continues to happen in landscape photography in particular. Um, what you see uh, was unique maybe 
couple of years back is no more unique now and 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 so this is a worry um, that we always have um even the post processing skills everybody is trying to keep pace with and and trying to um, up their game and and increase and share images which are actually stunning but what has happened in bargain is that we are now in a, in a situation where we don't see those unique images that we were seeing few years back um where are we headed from here um all those locations are getting crowded everybody is creating similar looking images compositions are also uh, appearing to be kind of influenced by um images taken by um all those masters who have started shooting much before when we started shooting so what is what is there in store for us in future how do we how do we proceed what do we do to still stay afloat and still stay relevant in this overcrowded um, arena of landscape photographers well i mean let's unpackage what you just said a little bit because i think there's a lot of different angles to approach for that particular subject and i don't necessarily know that there's a right or wrong answer i just know what my experience has been and kind of what my thoughts are but i think the first question to ask ourselves is do we think it's do you as a photographer i mean not you but the collective you do you think it's important to have unique or interesting f- photographs that other people don't have i think there's a lot of people that don't care about that you know they and that's totally fine and yeah. I, i and i don't think that's new i think it's just a matter of social media and we're getting a, we we are exposed to so much more photography than we ever have been before I also think photography is becoming more and more accessible through advances in technology with camera sensors and the accessibility of pho- photo education through sites like YouTube. Um it's 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 just a lot easier to take a good photograph now, right? Yeah. Um yeah. which is which is awesome. I think that's great. Um I think at the same time to your point, I think we are seeing an a saturation of good slash great photography of the same subjects that we've all seen over and over and over and over again. I think unless you've been a photographer for less than a couple of years, you've probably seen 20 photos of the same places, hundreds of photos of the same p- places and compositions, right? Yeah. Um maybe in different conditions or different slightly different angles or but you know, those same images keep coming up over and over and over again. I think I think that that is a reality that's born out of the facts that I just stated around the increased uh accessibility to photography. Um I think it's kind of an exciting time honestly to be a photographer. I think it, on one hand you could be discouraged in terms of how derivative it seems to have been becoming, but I think there's also become more and more opportunity to differentiate yourself as a photographer. uh not only in your post processing but just in personal vision and expression and that you know that doesn't necessarily mean you have to climb a mountain at sunrise to to get something that's personally connective to you i think there's other ways to do that you know i love the way that my friend sarah marino approaches photography you know she spends weeks at a time in places like death valley and takes photographs of a 2 by 2 square foot patch of of mud on the ground you'd never know it was death valley unless she told you it was you know but you yeah. know photographing those more intimate smaller scenes putting your own personal twist and revision on on those types of images um i think that's a that's a way to differentiate yourself i yeah. think there's still ways to visit iconic locations and get uh personally uh meaningful or in- interesting images like i have a i think 90% of landscape photographers who have been around for a while have a photograph of Toro Weep which is an overlook um in the Grand Canyon lots of people have that photo i have a different take on it i did like a star trails image of that image in a vertical format it's just different um so i think it's a difficult situation we find ourselves in i think it could discourage you but i think 
it's not that hard to find a way to separate yourself either. Um, at the end of the day, I think it depends too, like what kind of landscape photographer and nature photographer do you want to be? You know, are you taking photographs so that you can become popular on mm. social media? And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like if that's your goal and you know that if I take these photos and these popular locations, I'm going to achieve that. That's great. You know, that's awesome. If that's your goal. Go for it. I think if your goal is to create more personally meaningful and connecting images that speak to you as an individual, as an artist, I think that takes a lot more time and energy and a lot more failure and a lot more bad photos and patience. And I, but also I think embedded in that is how wonderful is that? that we have this thing that we can pursue that will keep us engaged on a personal level, yeah. on a creative level, for the potentially for the rest of our lives, right? So I think it's all about how you th yeah. think about it from for yourself. Yeah, I think very well answered. I think this is one of the most balanced answers that that gives us uh, a lot of different views to look at. Um, not not just getting stuck in that that one one way direction look that. Um, we are headed nowhere. I think that is not the right approach to even think. Um, and uh, if I, no, I just thought, um, another thought came to my mind is that um, everybody will have their own follower base as, as, um, as photographers. So maybe a particular location is, is shot million number of times, but um, there would still be photographers who would not have seen your image, which could be just one of those million of images, and they will get inspired to pick up the camera and become a photographer. I think that you, you've done your work. So I think you, if you've inspired in your own way. I think that is enough. Yeah. And I mean, deeply embedded in all of this conversation is what is your personal yeah, reason yeah, for yeah, making thing. photographs? Right, right, right. You know, and I think that can change over time too. You know, for me, it's definitely evolved over the last 10 years. And I think that's kind of fun, you know, keeps it, keeps it fun yeah. for me. Anyway, I think if I would have stuck to, cause I'm, I mean, I'll be honest. I used to chase the same scenes. Like I would go, that's embarrassing, but I'd go to Mark Adamus's website and I'd be like, I want to take that photo. I want to go to that waterfall. I want that exact composition. And I have some of those images in my in my portfolio. Yeah. Um, and that's how you learn too. You know, yeah. I think you go to those places and you see the scene the same way that that person saw that scene, and it and it can connect you visually. You can be like, oh, okay, now I can see how if I combine certain elements and shapes and shoot at this focal length, that's going to do this. So I think it, it's there's definitely nothing wrong with that. Right. And I think you eventually, it can be more than that. Right. It doesn't have to be. <laughs> Great, wonderful, Matt. Um, anybody has any question from the panel? Like, otherwise we can, we can wind up. It's already two and a half hours now. Yeah, not a question, but just a mention that uh, one of my absolute personal favorites from your collection is the full moon with a pigeon and turret. So oh, I thanks. totally, I totally love that. Thank amazing, you. Amazing, amazing image. Yeah, and that was a uh, hundred yards off a road, so <laughs> anyone could get it. Matt, probably just my parting words. Uh, we have had quite a few stalwarts on the show, but really, what makes you unique? Your ideological fabric. Yeah. Right and obviously the uniqueness of your creations right and obviously oh, which are hard you. to match because of the grueling effort that you put into those it shows uh personally for me this was probably the most reassuring uh, session that we have yeah. had uh making making sure that your produce is uh is something that an onlooker can experience right again right obviously which means that I mean, the onus is now on you, the producer, to make sure that you're 
you're creating something which is original and can be experienced right i think for me that's something that that will stay with me for a long time yeah right. me so too thank, thank you i I'd second that so absolutely yeah absolutely absolutely for me my takeaway is that i need to do the stairs 50 times a day starting from today <laughs> You can do it. You can do it. Uh, hey man, what, when I when I started when I started <laughs> when I started I weighed way too I was like 200 pounds, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but I was getting chunky and yeah, you just just put your mind towards it, dude. You can do it. Thank you. Thank you. I have not uh, I have not done it for a long time. Backpacking I had done for last one or one happy years at hand. That is making me stressed actually. I should go out soon and start hiking back. It's a lot easier the when you wear less. The sense of accomplishment that it gives to you, it's it's immense. Like you know, the sense of fulfillment that you know that yes, I have done something, not just you know, not just write another code, another piece of code in you know in Python or in Java. It just yes, you have climbed a mountain. Yes, you have done this trail. <laughs> that is a huge, I think, mental satisfaction and confidence that brings in to you. Right. Yeah. It has nothing to do with photography either. And what's cool about that yeah. too is you come away with zero photos you like, you still have a sense of accomplishment, which is nice. Yep, definitely, definitely. Agreed. All so right. I was wondering, um, yeah. would we be able to talk a little bit about my podcast? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yes. so sorry. Yes. Um, so, sorry, yeah, please, please, please do share. And because I'll yeah. be putting that link in the description as well. Please do share. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't need to spend a ton of time on it uh, for people that uh, haven't found the podcast yet. Um, I've started it in 2017 and, and I released a, I release a podcast a week. Yeah. It's called F-Stop, Collaborate and Listen, which is a play on words from a Vanilla Ice song, which my wife coined the name of the podcast, not me. Uh, so I can't take any credit for it. But uh, it started out as me just wanting to have casual kind of like what you guys are doing here having casual conversations with photographers about what we love to do and so um i'm about to release episode 170 cool. it's definitely evolved over the last couple of years hopefully people feel like it's gotten a little bit better uh, over time it, it it started out i i cussed a lot more back in the start and it had a little less direction and I said, um, and like a lot more than I do now. So it's also been a journey of personal growth. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's been a really fun experience. And I've gotten to know a lot of really amazing photographers and learn from them and, uh, you know, absorb information from them, kind of like what you guys are doing here. And it's it's been a really great experience. And we talk about creativity and motivation and post-processing and, uh people's past and you know techniques but we also dive into motive you know things like ethics and location sharing and we also talk about uh business and like how to do search engine optimization or how to market your photography so it covers like a very I've wide seen. variety of topics so so guys I've, i have listened to a few podcasts there and i i vouch for um kind of the quality that he produces mm -hmm. and the kind of speakers they come there they're very very inspiring and you must go and and listen to them i will be leaving the comment in the description um so to both nature first and and, and this as well so uh, don't oh, worry about you. that yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the best thing is that it's free and you can you know you can actually put on your yeah. headphone and you are just doing yeah, something you, you don't have to be like consumes very less data and then you know you can just listen to it and there are people from adobe and all and and you know i, I love that part that there are people from different kind of parts of the photography yeah. of landscape photography so right, you can right. get information so i'm sold i'm signing up as while we speak so the, <laughs> i should be listening to this tonight yeah yeah all right. Thank you, Matt. It's been a phenomenal session as Soom summed it up well. I don't have any words to add to that because um, this was unique. This was inspiring. This was a different league altogether. And um, I'm, I'm so uh, delighted to actually accept the fact that um, um, and, and say this online that we are so happy to have done this. And we are so happy that you are the special guest 
talking about such special code of ethics through your photography on our special 50th episode. And that means a lot. Very cool. Well, hold it. Hold it. Keep, keep up the good work, I think. Yes, you guys. Know. Yeah, guys. Just, just thumbs up so that I can take the screenshot. Yeah, everybody. Done. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. It was great knowing it was, you. Thank it was you. My, my pleasure. Thank you guys so much for being such gracious hosts. Thank you. Keep Bye -bye. inspiring us. Keep inspiring us. Yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 Good night, Prakash. Bye. 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 B